Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. Today, I have some absolutely terrifying experiences to share with you. Before we jump into them, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost you a cent. Click the like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things really do help this channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to today's upload, shall we? Today's first encounter is a subscriber's double submission. I narrated this subscriber's first experience he had about four days ago. He then sent me his second. So I'm just going to combine the two. That way you guys know which subscriber I am speaking of. And those of you who did not hear the first one will be able to hear it. And those of you who have, well, you get to hear it again. It was July of 1975. I was 16 years old, living in a small town just west of Rochester, New York. I'd seen a flyer promoting a Catholic youth organization in Rochester, a five-day hiking trip in the High Peaks region of the Adirondacks. My parents agreed that I could go. There were about 10 hikers and three counselors. The first four days slash nights were fun, but relatively uneventful. Hours on the trail, rarely meeting anyone else on the trail. Living on freeze-dried food, jerky, pemmican, and fruit leather. Sleeping in trail-side lean-tos or setting up our tents around a fire. Our last full day was spent on an ascent to Mount Marcy. We spent that last night at the base of the mountain. Our tents were set up in a semicircle around a fire. We sat around the fire singing the Obligatory songs, telling stories, joking, laughing. We were all in great spirits. One by one, everyone retired to their tent. My tent mate went as well, leaving me alone by the fire. As usual, I was the last one left by the fire. I always loved the night, especially when in the woods. So many people don't realize how alive the woods are at night. The animals scurrying through the leaf litter on the forest floor the occasional call of the night bird, roosting birds changing positions, and on this night, there was all of that, and off in the distance, there was one of my favorite nature sounds, the haunting call of the loon. Sat there, looking into the fire for quite some time, feeling happy that I had a wonderful time, but also slightly sad that it was ending tomorrow. Presently, I had noticed how quiet it had become. All the sounds of nature had ceased. Even the cry of the loon from the distant pond. The only sound was the crackling of the fire. I looked to my right and scanned the semicircle of tents. As I was doing this, I sensed movement out of the corner of my left eye. Turning my head, I saw about 20 feet away, peering out from behind the trunks of two huge trees, what appeared to be the profile of a very large wolf's head about six feet off of the ground, pointed muzzle, large upright ears, and its eyes reflecting in the light of the fire. For a brief moment, I was also startled and amazed to be afraid. It's incredible how quickly the human mind can work and how many times you can try to process at once. I remember thinking, too big for a coyote, there are no wolves left in this area. If there are, they don't climb trees, and they are not six feet tall. 
said the moment of amazement was very brief. It was replaced by a fear so intense that I felt it in the pit of my stomach. The type of fear that feels almost electric and that makes certain parts of the male anatomy shrink and want to crawl back up inside of you. Yet, even with this fear, my mind was still going a million miles an hour, trying to let it sink in. I could see its right shoulder, what would be the deltoid muscle on a human, looked huge, as did its bicep, its elbow was hidden by the trunk of the tree. I could see its forearm, it was held out horizontally. It looked somewhat slender, and its hand not paw, but a hand with long fingers ending in claws hung down at about a 90 degree angle. As odd as this was, what was even odder still was... There seemed to be a primitive yet roughly made woven basket hanging from its wrist. It turned its head in my direction, tilted its head, and looked at me from under its brow directly into my eyes. There was no bluish reflection as you would get from a coyote when their eyes are illuminated at night, nor did they glow red as my huskies used to do. They were a shiny black like obsidian reflecting the light from the fire. As our eyes met, I was hit with an immediate sense that it did not want it watching me, and also the deep feeling that it was disdainful of me and humans in general, and that if it wanted to, it could just make me disappear into the night forever. I knew I had to get out of its sight and fast. Since the first day of the trip, it had been drilled into our heads that the last person to leave the fire had to douse it. For this purpose, we had two buckets that we filled every evening, one with water and one with dirt. As I was the last one to go to bed, the buckets were next to me. All I wanted to do was dive into my tent. I didn't want to scream or yell. I sincerely doubt I would have been able to or douse the fire. I just wanted to get to where it couldn't see me, and more importantly, I couldn't see it. Yet the rational part of my brain told me that I didn't want to be responsible for burning down a large chunk of the Adirondack Park. I grabbed a bucket of water with my right hand and launched backwards from my crossed leg sitting position, threw the entire bucket into the fire. The hissing sound and the plume of steam are still very clear to me this day. The tent was no more than ten feet directly behind me as I scrambled inside, yanking the zipper down, and as I got deep into my sleeping bag as I could, and assumed the fetal position. That's all I remembered until morning. I was in my sleeping bag, head, shoulders, and arms outside of it. I heard birds singing their morning song, and the tent was slightly illuminated by a gray dawn. As I went to sit up, I realized that the tent flap was unzipped, and the lower half of my body was out of the tent. I rose, I heard muted voices coming from a few tents, but no one else had come out yet. I walked a bit away to find a tree and peed behind it, and when I returned, one of the counselors had gotten up to prepare breakfast. He asked me if I had slept well. I hesitated and then told him I had. My tent mate came out and I asked him if he had heard anything during the night. He said no. By that afternoon, we were on the bus and on our way home. I never told any of the group about what had happened. I never told anyone for decades. Pondered this event for years, analyzed it. I was thinking werewolf, but the only concept I had was the Hollywood version or the medieval accounts of the werewolf such as Peter Stubb. The accounts of them had them assuming the forms of wolves, not some half-man, half-human. The Hollywood versions of werewolves back then were basically just hairy guys with fangs until movies like The Howling came out with creatures similar to what I had seen, but only similar. I could not and still cannot wrap my head around people physically transforming into wolves as the years passed, while I still thought about it occasionally, I was busy working my ass off and distracted by life in general, until I heard about Linda Godfrey and the Beast of Bray Road. 
Bingo! But I still never told anyone about my encounter. Years ago, while watching TV with my wife, I came across a show, Monster Quest. The episode was about the American werewolf. I was riveted, so much so that my wife tapped me on the shoulder and said, For the third time, do you want some ice cream? My response was to turn to her and say, That's what I saw. I then told her of my encounter. I'm pretty sure she believes it was just my imagination back then, but she patted my shoulder and said something about it. I believe I saw it, and I believe I saw it. I read dozens, if not hundreds, of encounters online and in books since then. I found your channel a while back when I googled Dogman Encounters Adirondacks. I'll email you again with the encounter of a two-dimensional silhouette creature that seemed dog-like, yet also hyena-like. This was in Newburgh, New York in the mid-80s. Thank you. P. Now, after I had narrated this, I talked about a little bit about Mount Marcy. It is the largest mountain in the Adirondacks. Um, my mom actually climbed it while she was, I believe, five to six months pregnant with me. And it is exactly 180 miles from the subscriber's next encounter. I can't remember the exact year that this encounter happened. It was early fall, either 87 or 88. I'd been in the Army, an MP. My last duty station was the Stewart Army subpost at Stewart Airport in Newburgh, New York. After I got out of the Army in 1984, I decided to stay in the Hudson Valley instead of returning home to western New York. I got a good job working for a company that did unarmed and armed security, private investigations, and executive protection. This particular job was a surveillance of sewage treatment plant and a small lake that was the town of Newburgh's water supply. Evidently, there was a bone of contention between the company that wanted to build some houses and local residents concerned that the new houses were too close to the lake and that their septic systems may pollute the water. There was concern that someone may try to introduce raw sewage into the water supply. I was told that outside of me and only other people who knew of the surveillance were my boss, the chief of police. My boss met me at the site at dusk, showed me where to set up. There was a dirt road that runs around the treatment plant between the lake and the plant. The vehicle they gave me to use was a Ford Escort. Where I parked gave me a decent view of the plant. The trees were thick enough to do a good job of concealing the car, yet I was able to have a decent view of the plant. Directly in front of me, the trees were so thick and old, they made an arch over the dirt road, creating a tunnel of darkness. The front bumper of the car was up to where the tunnel of the shadow started. I sat there for hours in the chill autumn air, windows down, motor off. The person I saw was a worker from the plant who came out and smoked a cigarette about an hour after I started. Eventually, I got to the point where I needed to stretch my legs. I made sure the dome light would not come on and got out. I left the door open slightly to avoid making a sound. After stretching a bit, I decided to walk a ways down the dirt road. The trees made it pitch black. What little ambient light from the plant was completely blocked by the trees. Cautiously walking for about 20 feet into the darkness when I heard directly in front of me a deep, loud growl. At first I thought someone decided to walk their dog, but then a noxious smell hit me. The smell of musk, decay, and filth. At the same time, a feeling of dread came over me and the growl came again, a bit closer. I was carrying a 357 Magnum at the time, drew it, held it at the ready as I began walking backwards. 
I was only 20 feet back to the car, but it seemed like a mile. As soon as I got to the car, I slid into it, shut the door as quickly and quietly as I could. No sooner than I did this, something came trotting out of the shadows. It was four-legged and huge. If it had approached the car, its head would have been equal to the roof. The head was massive. It had the same general shape of a Burmese mountain dog. It had a ruff of fur from its shoulders to the back of its head. The rest of it was odd-looking. Well, the body might have been about five feet long. It still looked too small for this massive head. The back sloped down considerably. Its hind legs were ridiculously short in comparison to the front. The tail was long, slender, and held out horizontally. It's completely black, unnaturally so. It did not seem to have any depth to it. I had a feeling that if it turned its body, it would have disappeared. No features, no panting, no sounds of its feet as it trotted by. Five feet from my open window. It looked neither left nor right as it passed. Needless to say, I stayed in the vehicle for the rest of the night. My boss called me the next afternoon to see how it went. I told him the only thing I had seen was a stray dog. Nothing happened the next night. The last night I had worked this particular gig. On a personal, I asked this gentleman if he'd come on and share both of these encounters. He's going to think about it. He's a little camera shy. Even though there will be no camera, there will be a mic. But... I will send him an email. Also, I'm going to say it now. It's just me and you, my friend. Um, I say this to everybody. Just make it like you and I are in a car and I just shared my encounter with you. And you're like, oh yeah, I had something like that happen. And maybe that'll be a little easier. But I'd love to have you on, my friend. Thank you. This next part of the upload is a email I received from a subscriber and uh, she reached out to me. I emailed her back immediately and I'm going to share with you the email because I want you guys to kind of be informed about what may possibly be coming soon. Um, like I said, I did email her back uh, in regards to this email. It's a very interesting. Hey Jeff, I befriended a good man this year and have been talking to him for some time. We speak daily. He is an ex-serviceman, a special type of Marine, multiple tours. We were chatting randomly and he sometimes tells me stuff about his time in the Middle East. He did multiple tours there. He suffers from PTSD, so we speak daily. I believe it helps him somewhat. I said you must have some harrowing experiences and conveyed my feelings about that. He then started to tell me what he deems a weird experience there. He told me about how him and his unit were asked to kill a big wolf that was killing things. He didn't say what it was killing, and I didn't ask. He didn't specify too many details, but told me that it was a big, big, big wolf. He saw it with his own eyes and shot at it. He told me it stood as tall as a man on its back legs. He mentioned they had to use big bore weapons to kill it. When he said to me, don't know what it was, but it was huge, I told him that it could have been a dog man. He said, what's that? I told him that they are all over the world and directed him to your YouTube channel. I feel like there are plenty more he purposely didn't tell me, and I respect that completely. I believe him. He is an honorable man, a truthful, proud man. Can I please give him your contact details? Maybe you could talk to him about what he had encountered. Thanks. Well, I don't know if she and he listen to this channel, but if he does, or if she is, I would like to thank the gentleman for his years of service to this great country and I would love to talk with him. Anonymity is always respected, always. 
And um, even if he doesn't want to come on live and share, if he gives me permission to share, I would love it. And uh, I think it may help him uh, release some of those pent-up feelings about possibly seeing some otherworldly things while over in the Middle East. I'm not saying it'll help him with the PTSD of the war, but maybe the unexplainable things it may help. So, please reach out back to me. I'd appreciate it. Today's third subscriber submission. Hey Jeff, new sub here. I stumbled onto your channel doing some research on Dogman. Great stuff. Really enjoy the stories. So I had an encounter of my own. I was really young, like four, so the details have always been hard to get straight in my mind. It's kind of a long story, and recently I got the courage to bring it up to my older brother and dad. My older brother, who was six, completely confirmed it, and my dad had a slightly different take, but both confirmed something very weird did happen. So, here it goes. I grew up in Canterbury, Belmore, North South Wales, just west of Sydney in the early 80s. Suburban family homes everywhere, no forest, close, but everyone had a very big backyard. My dad, being a carpenter, had built this tree house about 25 feet up into this old laurel tree. He is a great dad, so my brother and I were always outside every afternoon playing all sorts of games and just having fun together. Now, this was the 80s, so it was not unusual for kids to be out until the streetlights came on. The house had a big gully. That's what we called it. It ran along the back of the property. We had a six-foot hardwood fence all around, so we were pretty safe. The gully was the old milk run and basically where they used to clean people's bedpans, etc. from back in the day. It was overgrown with weeds and was mostly a swell drain. About eight feet wide and on the other side was the backyard of our rear neighbors. We used to run down to it and go to the other friend's house up and down. Some had gates to go through, and others, we just had to get cinder blocks so we could climb over the fence. We did see dead chickens, cats, and dogs all the time, ripped up and not completely consumed. It was fairly regular to see, and we paid it no mind. Maybe poked them with a stick every now and then. They mostly looked like they had been killed but not eaten. Being Australian, we are aware that with snake and spiders... Sometimes things just get killed picking a fight with something that's far more dangerous, if not as big. I was fairly young, so I wouldn't go down to the gully unless my older brother was with me. I just never really felt comfortable by myself, and sometimes the older kids would make fun of me or try to run off and scare me more. It's a bit of the backstory, so here's our encounter. I had just finished school and my brother and I had walked home, maybe 3.30 on a November summer in Sydney. It was about a mile. Got a snack and headed out to the backyard. We had an Irish shutter called Trelfez and he loved to play catch. So I was throwing the ball with him and my older brother was in the treehouse. The treehouse was dead center of the yard and was awesome lookout point. You could see clear into all neighbors' places and across the street out front. So I'm throwing the ball and I threw it up the backyard and it rolls up to the back left corner of the yard where my dad had pulled down the old outhouse made of sheet metal all rusted up. We kind of stayed away because snakes love to get under it because it holds the heat of the summer. Anyway, I ran up there to get the ball for trout who couldn't get under it without the metal cutting his snout. But I decided to jump on the metal first to scare away any snakes. And that's when I saw it. I think I scared it with the loud metal sound, but the huge head, like a wolf, 
stood up over the top of the fence. Now the fence was six feet, and it cleared it by a good foot or more. It didn't make a sound, just looked at me with these large amber-colored eyes, the size of a man's fist to give a perspective of how big they were. Instant fear gripped me, the fear that froze me. But I was a pretty brave kid, and it's like I instantly knew the fear was not really my own, but somehow this thing was trying to make me feel more fearful, somehow, if that makes any sense. Maybe looking at me for three seconds, which felt like forever, I called out to my brother, Jake. Nothing came out of my mouth, so I tried again. Never looking away, this time I got a whisper that slowly got louder. Jake! He immediately started yelling for Dad. As soon as Jake called out to my dad, the dog man dropped eye contact with me and dropped below the fence line. I immediately felt better jumping up the fence to look down the gully to see this dog man running. It was already 60 to 70 yards up the gully. Dad came out, thought it was some older kids who had been having some water bomb wars with. Now, that's just the start, because here is where the real paranormal stuff started. About two days after the encounter, one night at like three in the morning, I woke up to heavy breathing. It was just like Darth Vader from Star Wars. Obviously, I was scared of it as a kid. Mechanical breathing, footsteps, very deliberate steps. Not too loud, but you could hear someone slowly walking down the hallway. My older brother and I shared a bedroom and had bunk beds. He had the top and I was on the bottom, of course, being the younger brother. Immediately, I was gripped by fear. I couldn't even see say Jake's name and knew it was the wolf, which is what I had named it. Walks into the open doorway of our bedroom. Just a black shadow, not resembling anything but just a shadow in the outline of a seven-foot man-thing. I threw the covers over my head. I was so scared. It came closer and seemed to try to get to my brother. First I heard him stir, but he rolled over. He would later tell me that he was fully aware it was there but chose to ignore it, which seemed to work because it lowered its head and came right close to mine. I could feel its breath on the sheet over my head. It stayed like that until the light came. I was exhausted once it finally left and jumped up and cuddled in my mom and dad's bed. This would go on for years. I learned not to pull the covers over my head and it would just stay in the doorway. I would close the door when we went to bed only to wake up to find it open. Dad or mom would open it just to keep an ear on me and my brother. It became a thing where I wouldn't sleep unless my dad was there with me. I'd wake up and hear the breathing and make dad come in and stay in my room with me. We would move house a lot. My parents got divorced. This thing would go away. I'd have years where it wouldn't happen, only for it to find me again and start. When I was 13, we moved hours away from Sydney, and it stopped for three years. The last time it happened, I was 16, a lot older and bigger. I heard the breathing start in the footsteps and decided I'm going to face this thing. I'm scared of it, but I can now put up a fight. It fled. I stayed up all night outside of the house just to show it. I was not going to be an easy target anymore. Never seen it since. Hope you are doing well. Thanks for the channel and stories. Wrote this on my phone, so hopefully not too many spelling mistakes. Peace and friendship. E. That's curious and very baffling because obviously your brother and you saw this. I don't know if your dad maybe caught the tail end of it in the very beginning, but I was at first going to say, maybe it was, you know, just uh, you having night terrors or just your imagination because 
seeing something like that at such a, a young age was so traumatic for you. Um, but then when you said your brother had seen it and you could feel its breath, um, that, that's just one thing I don't know. I'm curious if it did maybe follow you, um, and just had no respect and entered your home without being invited, even though I don't think that matters. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I mean, who knows? But it's definitely terrifying. Gosh, just the first part, seeing it behind your fence. Mm. Just terrifying. But thank you for sharing it with me. I appreciate that. I'm going to send you an email, and hopefully you can uh, come on the show and share this uh, in your own words. Today's final encounter. First off, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself before I get into my story of my personal encounter with the dog man. My name is R, but most of my friends call me Bull. I'm an avid hunter and outdoorsman. I always in the mountains doing something with nature. It was the fall of 2020 and the Pennsylvania rifle season had opened the Saturday before and as usual, my friend, and hunting partner Jeff had left the house about a half an hour south of where we had planned to hunt our favorite mountain in the Manchu State Forest, Adams County, Pennsylvania, just above the town of Fairfield. Now the ride up the mountain is 90% dirt logging roads, traveling up the mountain, no cell service, and here and there you would pass an old hunting cabin, but they are few and far between. So as we start up the mountain, we had a small doe run across the front of the pickup truck. So we figured, hey, today may be a pretty good day in the woods. We made it up to the ridge to our pull-off. It was about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. At this point, get out of the truck, loaded up, and headed for the stands. We have about a mile or so walk into the woods before there's a fork in the trail where Jeff and I would split up and go off to our, each of our spots, but we kept in communication with walkie-talkie radio, so I eventually reached my stand, get settled in for the morning. It was your typical morning in the deer, woods, birds, chirping squirrels running around, the normal. I had sat till about 10.30 that morning and got a radio call from Jeff that he hadn't seen anything that morning, nor had I, so we decided we'll head off the mountain and go get some breakfast at the local diner down at the bottom of the mountain. After breakfast, the weather had started to turn kind of rainy and gloomy, and Jeff decided he wasn't heading out for the evening sit that evening, so I dropped him off at his truck I headed back out for the evening, sit, and I reached our pull-off again at around 2 in the afternoon. After just taking a drive around the logging road, seeing if I could see deer moving across the ridge, parked the truck, shut the engine off, climbed out, grabbed my pack, and headed for my stand. After my walk in, I reached my stand at about 245 Climbed up, got settled in for the evening. A few hours had passed, hadn't seen much beside a spike buck, a small doe. And it was getting to be about magic hour, that last hour to 45 minutes before dark, when everything was starting to get on its feet and start moving out of the bedding areas. Well, it was about 5.15 or so, I guess I had heard some things snap to my left and look up and saw the ears of a doe coming through the mountain laurel. So I grabbed my .30-06, got ready to take the shot. Well, she had walked out into a little opening, but had just stopped behind the laurel, so I waited. She had poked her head out, but still no shot. Then I had noticed the woods had started to get silent. Now I'm talking no wind, birds, chipmunks, nothing made a sound. Then I heard a snap of a decent-sized stick and figured it maybe a buck was following this doe. Well, 
she had shot her head up and stomped her hood twice and bolted into the woods. I mean, within seconds she was gone. Now, mind you, at this point I could see the underbrush and mountain laurel was starting to get dark at this point. It's hard to see into, so I was on the watch for whatever had broke the stick. Then I started to get this musky smell, almost like a dead animal in stagnant pond water and ammonia. It was horrible, no idea where it was coming from, so I gathered my gear and got down and made my way out to the logging road and started the trek back to the truck. On the way, I was about a quarter of a mile way back when I had just gotten the feeling that I was being followed. Now I know the area had bear, coyote, and occasional mountain lion sighting, which was always shot down by the forest rangers and game wardens as people seeing bobcats, but I knew better. So I shined my light around me and didn't see anything out of the ordinary, but still just had that feeling, so I picked up the pace and got back to the truck. As I was putting my gear in the truck, put my rifle, all except my rifle, I had started getting the smell again coming back up the logging trail, so I shined my light. Curiosity got the better of me. And I would say about a hundred yards or so back, I saw two reddish-orange eyes, which normal animal has that kind of eye shine, so I yelled, Hey, get out of here! At least three times, but nothing phased it, so I raised my rifle and fired a shot into the area above it. Then this beast stood up on its hind legs. It had to be somewhere between seven to eight feet tall, and I guess... You could make out the pointy ears, the elongated snout, and it let out the most god-awful guttural howl I'd ever heard in my life. I threw my rifle in the back of the truck, jumped in, and took off down the mountain. Never looking back again to this day, I have not set foot on that logging trail since. Not sure if I ever will again after that experience. All right, folks, I hope you all enjoyed today's upload as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you, and I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. After all, it is your support that keeps this channel growing and going, and what gives us all a place to share our experiences and theories judgment-free. Everyone's simply treated with the respect that we all deserve, and that is because of all of you, so thank you. Please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there and dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless.